And we have a special word, I believe, for you. If you have your Bibles, can you turn with me to the book of John, chapter 12? We'll begin at verse number 20. John, chapter 12, verse number 20 to 27. I have a very interesting title, and you might not like it when you hear it, but there's a meaning to that if you hold on. And stay with me throughout this message. You'll understand why as we begin verse number 20. And there were certain Greeks. You got to watch out for these Greeks, I tell you. <laughs> among them that came up to worship at the feast. Notice, please. And I just want to stop right here for a moment. The feast. And this becomes extremely significant. Every word in the Bible is significant. And sometimes we read it and we pass by it. But there's a reason why. John, who's the author of this book, mentions the feast. There's a spiritual implication to that. Let's continue. Verse number 21. And the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die. Please, again, focus on the word die. We don't like to focus on this, but there's again a tremendous spiritual implication to this. It abideth alone, but if it dies or die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Verse 25. And he that loveth his life shall lose it. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth, hateth. Well, let's, let's go back to that word. He that hateth, in the Greek that has a very deep meaning, it means in the English to hate. He that hateth his life in this world, notice this world, the word this world, in this world, shall keep it unto life eternal. Interesting. Verse 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, is my soul troubled? Please notice the word troubled. And what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Wow. What a tremendous portion in the Bible. This, this section here, friends, is one of the most powerful Texts in the entire word of God, and we'll see why in a few moments. This text really explains the very purpose and essence of why Jesus came to this earth. And what Jesus asks us to do as his disciples. We notice that when these Greeks approach Jesus searching for answers, the Bible tells us it was during the feast and so it, it, it behooves us to come to understand what, what kind of feast was this. The Bible's not clear. In some texts it says it was the Passover. Some believe this feast was during the Feast of Pentecost. And so it's not clear. However, I believe it was the time of the Passover. But we're going to focus in on the feast a little bit later. But I'm just kind of whetting your appetite because it becomes extremely significant as the backdrop of the teachings of Jesus. I've entitled this message, Hating Your Life. I mean, it's not something you're going to sell tapes on or CDs or, hey, let's go get the CD, Hating Your Life. That really appeals to me. But that's what Jesus said. George, can you give me that verse again? It says, if you do not hate your life, want to lose your life, you cannot experience what I have in store for you. You will never experience eternal life. And so what does that actually mean? 
when Jesus said, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal. What does that really mean? Is this the message that we are hearing today? These are the words of Jesus. Jesus answers these Greeks that are searching for truth. We begin this morning by explaining to all of that. We need to understand that the Greeks of that day were, as it were, on the cutting edge of philosophy. Uh, the Greeks were uh, known as being intellects. They brought uh, medicine, they brought all things into this world, into the world at the time. They introduced mathematics, they introduced science, all things, philosophies. They were on the cutting edge of what was going on at that time. And here come these Greeks who are apparently uh, wise. They are seekers of wisdom. They are on the cutting edge of knowledge, of understanding of what is going on in the world, but they're coming to seek after Jesus? It doesn't seem to make sense, really, naturally. And so they approach the disciples of Jesus. I mean, who else are you going to approach if you want to see Jesus than to at least ask the disciples where Jesus is? Let me ask you, would those Greeks come and ask you where Jesus is? Would they approach you because they see something in you? Or me? And so they approach Philip, they approach Andrew, we want to see Jesus. And so Philip and Andrew approach Jesus. And they tell Jesus, excuse me, Jesus, but we've got company here. We've got these Greeks, they want to see you. These Greeks, these Greeks, they want to come to talk to you. Now these Greeks, as I mentioned, were on the cutting edge of knowledge and in uh, and the worldly wisdom of the day. But the Greeks were outside the covenant of salvation. They did not know God. They were heathens. They were idolaters. The Greek gods were vast and many. Zeus was their main god, not Jehovah God of the Hebrews. These Greeks had no understanding of spiritual truth as we know it, but here's the key and life lesson number one. We'll be sharing a few life lessons as we continue this morning. And the first life lesson is notice that they are seeking after Jesus. Seekers are finders. Now we need to understand what does it mean to seek God or to seek after Jesus. We, we kind of make this word and we trivialize this word. We, we don't really understand what the word to seek means. And I've said this over and over again. The word to seek it speaks of passion and hunger. It's, it's, it, it comes from the mindset of, 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 of wild uh, dogs or wolves who seek after their prey. And when you get a hunting dog, especially in England, you know they've got these beagles and they hunt after foxes. These beagles are relentless. They will not stop until they get their prey. Seekers are finders. If you're truly seeking after God, you will come to see him. So when I hear people tell me, well, you know, I prayed, Pastor, I've kind of, you know, I sought God, and you know, but I, let me tell you something. If you're truly seeking God, you will find answers. That's why Jesus said, ask, seek, and not for it shall be open. True seekers are finders. Period. That's just the way it is. And so these seekers who are Greek are seeking answers and they're coming to Jesus because they're hungry for truth. And that sounds paradoxical because of the cutting edge and the time of the day, the Greeks were the ones that seemed to have all the answers, but these Greeks didn't. Because they didn't have the answers. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof is death. The world, they think they have the answers. So there are some people who think they have the answers, but they don't. They're still in emptiness. And so paradoxically, these Greeks who, who uh, their culture and their wise and the mindsets, they had the answers. They're on the cutting edge of everything. They were still empty and they were seeking after Jesus because they saw something in Jesus, just like the world saw something in Jesus. The Bible tells us that when Jesus spoke, people were ecstatic. They were, they were astonished is what they use in the English word. It comes from the Greek word ecstasia, which they were, they were ecstatic when Jesus spoke because Jesus didn't speak like a mere man. He didn't speak just religious concepts and ideologies. Jesus spoke differently. He did different things. He acted differently. He said that he was not a regular human being. He didn't speak like a simple teacher or some prophet. He was, and then people were drawn to him. And these Greeks were drawn to Jesus because they were searching for something, for some truth. 
that their culture couldn't bring them, that their teachings couldn't bring them. And then Jesus responds in a way that Jesus normally responds. It just didn't seem to make sense. It just didn't seem to make sense. Can you give me verse 23, George? So Jesus knows everything. He sees these Greeks. Philip and Andrew approach him. And here is Jesus' response. And Jesus answered him saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man shall be glorified. Uh... Okay, thank you, but what, what does that mean? The Son of Man shall be glorified. Verse 24. Verily, verily, saying to you, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, to the natural mind, what, what, what kind of answer is that? How many times are we seeking God or looking to God or crying out to God initially and we, we might get an answer but it doesn't seem to make sense to us. Or maybe God is telling us to do something it doesn't make sense to us. It sounds confusing. A little different. And I can assure you when I've prayed and I've sought God for answers in my life or direction in my life I can tell you friends nine times out of ten when I've believed the Lord spoken to me it always didn't make sense to me. And it certainly wasn't clear in the beginning stages. And I'll tell you why. Because God's ways are not our ways. Things will not always make sense in the natural realm when God is speaking to you. That's why you must come to him with a spiritual mind, not a natural mind. These Greeks were natural. Even though they were seeking, they still had a natural mindset. And for that matter, so did his disciples at this point. Until something changed. But they were not part of the covenant. The disciples embraced the Messiah. But these Greeks were heathens. And he says my hour has come. Some scholars believe that these Greeks were proselytes. They were Greeks that were converted to Judaism. It's a possibility. We're not sure. It's not clear. But notice what Jesus said about my hour. Can you give me verse 27 and verse 32 please George. So Jesus is saying my hour has come. What does this hour mean? Now is my soul troubled. So Jesus is troubled. But, but my hour has come that you'll be glorified and you're troubled? That doesn't make sense. Why, does, why would your heart be troubled? And what shall I say, Father, save me from this? Save, I thought you're going to be glorified. It, what do you mean you're troubled, Jesus? Troubled for what? But for this cause I came into this hour. Troubled for what? Jesus, could you be speaking about your crucifixion? Could you be speaking about the cross? Is that how you're going to be glorified? Through your death? Is that why you're troubled? Was this another form of Gethsemane? Not my will be done, but yours? That's why many believe this feast was the Passover. Jesus used always the backdrop of the question, of the surroundings, of the season to illustrate a spiritual truth. That's how he operated. Jesus always did that. So some scholars believe this was an illustration of what is going to happen. Because the feast of the Passover, this would be a great moment for Jesus to talk about his death and resurrection. Because that's what the Passover is. My hour has come. This hour speaks of a death. This hour speaks of a crucifixion. But this hour also speaks of a resurrection. That's why he said, my hour has come that the Son of Man shall be glorified. You see, without a death, there's no resurrection. And then he says, whoever will seek his life will lose it. Verse 25. Whoever will seek. Now, here's where the Greek mindset, they won't like this. Because what was the Greek mindset? What was the culture? The Epicureans, which were Greek philosophers of that day, of that day, their philosophy was, is, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we, la joie de vie, have fun, let's just live for the moment. Let's enjoy our life. I don't care about the consequences. Time is short. You've heard that. Oh, time's short, let's live it up. Let's have fun. Time is short. You know, I've had that. 
I, I, are you kidding me? How many times have I heard that? Oh, pastor, time's short. You know, I want to go have that. One. I understand time is short. But from a world's perspective, time's short. So let me have as much fun as I can get in this world. Living for the moment. Living for pleasure. Satisfaction. Guaranteed. Parties. And cabanas. Let's have it. Let's live for the moment. After all, you live only once. You've heard that before. Let's have fun. I understand that. I did that most of my life when I was a teenager. All of my life. How about that? Not most, all. But Jesus says, whoever will seek. Remember that word seek is to pursue. To pursue. You're out of breath. You're pursuing. His life will lose it. Will lose what? That I'm seeking it. You'll lose your life in eternity. Jesus is always speaking about a spiritual element, but uses the natural to explain the spiritual. You will lose your life. This was the very opposite of Greek thinking. The Greco-Roman uh, mindset was to live for the moment and have as much fun. So let's have these great big parties. They had in Rome vomitariums. And what they would do is they would have parties, they would get drunk, and they would have the greatest feasts, and they would go to rooms, and they would vomit. They would, you know... Uh, I, uh, I, I don't know. They would just. I don't know how they would do. It. They would just put their, I guess, their hands in their mouths, and they would vomit. They vomitarium. They would vomit in these bins, and they would go back and eat again. I'm serious. You don't believe, Google it. Check it out. Do research. Don't just eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die, and you're full. No problem. We get. We'll throw it all up, and we'll go back and eat again. That was the mindset of that day. And by the way, it still exists today. You think things have changed? Things haven't changed. Things have gotten worse, I think. And this was the very opposite of Greek thinking. And here come the Greeks. See, everything Jesus says is the very opposite of what the world says. The way up is the way down. You want to gain your life? Don't live just for yourself. Lose it. We'll find out what losing your life means in a moment. And so, he has the attention of these Greeks. And these Greeks are at the door seeking answers. And now Jesus is talking about wheat. Why wheat? Corn. And here come other scholars who tells us, no, this wasn't the Passover. This was the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, so if it was Passover, then we can understand dying, the cross. But if it was the harvest time, what was the Feast of Pentecost? The Feast of Pentecost was a celebration of the harvest. And they would come, it was a festivity, it was a festival, it was part of how Jews would celebrate a part of God's blessings. They would be grateful for the harvest and it would be called the Feast of Pentecost and they would celebrate the blessing of God. And so remember, Jesus is using the backdrop of this feast as an illustration of a spiritual principle. And now we come to possibly Jesus talking about what the Feast of Pentecost meant in what his purpose in coming to this earth is all about. Can this be true? Well, it's plausible. Let's continue. We'll see why. It seems strange, however, but very significant. He says, except a grain of wheat die and fall to the earth, it abides alone. Here is a picture of what will happen to Jesus. Here's where the Passover comes, that he had to die and rise again. It's a picture, of, but also a picture, really, and a message to all of us. That this principle of a, of a seed falling to the ground and dying is the key to bearing fruit is a principle that applies to us today as it did back then. But we all know that a harvest cannot take place unless the seed germinates and dies and produces fruit. Otherwise, you'd have no harvest. So, so stay with me. So if it was the Passover that was the backdrop, that applies because, because, because you must die and if there's no death, there's no resurrection. And Jesus said, if you love your life, you'll lose it. So that, that, that's applicable. But it's also applicable if this is the Feast of Pentecost, that, that, that it's also a celebration of life and of harvest, that, and, that harvest can never take place unless there's a death of a seed. 
You can never have a harvest unless there's, no, unless there's a sacrifice. You can't have a harvest unless there's a, the seed germinates and dies in order for there to be fruit. But it's not the feast that we're concerned about. That's not the issue of this message or the theme of this message or the point of this message. It's what Jesus said that's extremely important. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, dies, if that doesn't happen, it will not produce any fruit whatsoever. Jesus has given answers, answers that these Greeks and all of us need to understand that you cannot be fruitful unless you die. And you Greeks who come to me with all of your intellect and all of your savoir, you know, savoir, all of this ability and all of this knowledge and all of this, this incredible uh, you know, ways that you have brought in the medicines and culture and, and architecture and agriculture, all these things that you are so known for, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God with all these things that you have. You can't come with your strength you can't come to God with your ability and with your knowledge or with your expertise or how great you might have or be here that means nothing it might be important to the world the way the world functions but in the spirit realm it doesn't mean anything. It's not about how smart you are, how intelligent you are, how great you are, how powerful you are. Now, now stay with me because I'm going deep this morning. Some of you may not like what I'm going to say, but just stay with me. Stay with me to the end. Listen, I believe you can hear Jesus saying, I'm through entertaining company. Yeah, I'm through. Why am I saying that? George, can you give me verse 37, please? Can you give me verse 37? Watch this, watch this, watch this. This is, this is an insight. You see, but though he had done many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. I'm through performing all these things. My hour has come now. I'm going into another gear. That, that, what I've done in the past is over. I'm through entertaining you. I'm through of raising up the dead. I'm through with opening the eyes of the blind. I'm through with walking on water. My hour has come. My hour has come. Something's going to change. I've done all I can do in this form. My hour has come. There's a change taking place. You're coming to me, Greek, because you've heard of what I've done and what I've said. But that hour is changing. Something's going to change. There's going to be a shifting going on. I'm through. With opening the eyes of the blind. Something's going to change. My hour has come. I've done all I can do in this current form. All the miracles I did and yet most of you didn't believe. How many maybe in this room have said if I can only see a miracle then I will believe. If I only see a parting of the Red Sea, I will believe. If, if only I can see a multiplication. Listen, we all want to see things, but if that's going to be the basis of your belief, you are in some serious trouble. Jesus is saying, I've done all I can do in this current form. My hour has come. My hour has come. There's going to be a change. I'm troubled by it, but, but things are changing. I'm troubled by this, verse 27. But, but, but that's the only way I can be glorified. Let me ask you, my friends. I got, I got to pause here for a moment. I got to ask you a very pertinent question. Let me ask you, have you done all you can do in your current form? My God. Have you done all? Yes, you. Oh, pastor, you should never use the word you. You should always use the word we. No, no. Have you done all you can do in your current form? Just think about it. Are you doing your best in your service for Christ? Just think about that for a moment. Because that's what we're going to be based on. Judge, listen, God has given everyone here, Matthew 25, talents. Some of you have got five talents. Some of you have got two talents. Some of you have got one talent. We'll be preaching on this very soon, I believe. 
I preached on it before, but I got something different to share with you. Five, five, two, one. All of us, none of us in this room who are believers have no talents. We all have something. I don't care what it is. We all have a gift. Don't let the devil tell you, well, you know, pastor, I can't do that. That's a lie. You've got a gift. Let me ask you, are you doing the best that you can do with the gift that God has given you? Think about it. Jesus is saying, I've, I've done all I could do. Now, 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 now listen, friends. Is, is, it possible, is it possible in this text that Jesus, watch this, that God wants to do, listen, wants to do something in your life and in my life here? Is it possible, is it possible that what Jesus is saying about losing your life is applicable to to you and me as well is it possible that when Jesus spoke to these Greeks that really his message is not just to these Greeks but to every one of us is it possible that what Jesus is saying applies to us here today in the year 2019 he is saying except a grain of wheat die falls to the ground if that doesn't happen, it abides alone. In other words, there's no fruit. How many are believers are there? Watch this. I'm going to get, this might hurt. I, how many are there who are in the church who claim to be believers, but, but, but the seed has not died. There's no germination and it abides alone. In other words, there's no fruit. Is it possible there's no fruit in your life or my life because the seed is not dead yet? Because you haven't died yet to the things of this world? Is it possible there's no fruit or there's very little things happening in your life because you're still alive to your ways? That you're not dead yet? Is it possible? So whether it was the Passover feast or whether it was the feast of Pentecost, it doesn't matter because in both feasts there must be a death. In order for there to be life. Hmm. Is that perhaps the problem with some of us who may have been in the church for many, 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 many years, but not much fruit, no passion, no joy, no. Maybe we live for ourselves a little bit too much. Huh? Now watch this, watch this, watch this. What Jesus is saying is without sacrifice, there's no fruit. I healed, oh, look, 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 again, just stay with me. I healed people, what Jesus is saying, watch this. I healed people, but there was no sacrifice in that. What? Yeah, just stay, stay with me, I'm, don't worry. I opened the eyes of the blind, but there was no sacrifice in that. I walked on water, but there was no sacrifice in that. There's no sacrifice that I did all these miracles because I'm God. You see, my deity allows me to walk on water. My deity allows me to heal the sick. My deity is what caused me to do and perform these miracles. There was no sacrifice in that. Do you think God sweats when he does a miracle? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, that brother down there, oh my son, my daughter, they're suffering. They're in, they got, they've got the terrible, painful experience. Oh, let me see. This is gonna, this is gonna be tough for me to deal. It's gonna be tough. Let me see if I can. can God's got no obstacles. He's got no rifles. There's nothing that's difficult for God. God doesn't, you know, say, you know, sticking out, puts his hand on his forehead. And, oh, how am I gonna work this? Out? This, this, this is gonna be difficult. God doesn't. That's a human trait. When Jesus healed, that wasn't difficult for Jesus. Let me ask you, when Jesus was on his way to heal Jairus' daughter, he's on his way in Matthew 5, uh, Mark 5 and 6, 6. All of a sudden, this woman with the issue of blood, she hears about Jesus and she approaches him. And she says, if I can only just touch the hem of his garment. And she fights the crowd and she touches the hem of his garment. What did Jesus do? He turns around and says, what? Who touched me? Jesus healed her. And he didn't even know it in his humanity. It was his deity that healed her. There's no sacrifice in that. Because he's God. 
So what sacrifice is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the thing that troubled him wasn't the fact that he can heal. He can heal because he's God. Verse 27, George was troubled because he's speaking about the cross. He's speaking about Gethsemane. When he sweat as if it were bloods of sweat, the pain, he was being pressed. Lord, I, Father, I don't really want to go through this. I'm troubled, but, 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 but not my will. Let your will. This is what he's, that's what sacrifice was to him. Not the fact that he healed people. He healed people because he's God. I'm going to be straight with you. If you're a naturally, if you're, Josh was a great musician, but I'm going to be honest with you. And he won't say no. Or if Garrett is dad. If you've got a gift, a great gift, and you can play it, and people say, oh, what a great, you know, to be honest with you, that's not that much sacrifice because you've got the gift. It's easy for you. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now, if you get me up there and play, that's a sac, hey, you better say praise God for that. <laughs> you see what I'm trying to say, folks? When you have a gifting it, and it's natural for you, it's not that much of a sacrifice. Jesus' healings of people was part of his DNA. It's God. But now that he's going to the cross, he's going to humble himself and be ridiculed by his own people, that would be a sacrifice. And that sacrifice now he's bringing to you and me. He's bringing that element of sacrifice to you and me. You see, in order to have an ultimate harvest, I must have an ultimate sacrifice. So whether you're talking about the Passover or the Feast of Pentecost, it applies the same. Sacrifice is the key. There's no cross, there's no resurrection. There's no death of a seed. There's no life. There must be some death, some sacrifice in order for there to be fruit on any level. This is the principle that Jesus is bringing to these Greeks who didn't get it. And for that matter, even the disciples didn't get it till later. This is the premise, my brother. What I'm sharing with you today is the premise of everything in the spirit realm. And even in the natural realm. Because people who do succeed in life, they have to sacrifice as well. Time, effort, money. But this is what Jesus is saying to us today. From a spiritual perspective, it is the premise of anything and everything. And when it comes to your spiritual growth, if there's no sacrifice, you will never grow. If you think you can just come to church and serve God and just be okay about it and there's no pursuing, there's no denial, there's no self, you will never grow. It abides alone. And that is the problem today. Oh, I know it's not popular with the preaching of today. Oh, just name it and claim it. Just call upon God. He'll answer you anytime. You know, he's just some big cosmic Santa Claus. He'll bring his goodies to give. You don't have to do anything about it. Just sit and receive, brother. Just sit and receive. I got a great Greek word for that. Hogwash. <laughs> Ridiculous. Ridiculous. There, there are teachings today that are absolutely erroneous and they are wrong and they are, it's complete heresy. Complete heresy. They have twisted the word of God. For their own purposes. For their own flesh. This gospel we hear today satisfies the flesh. It's got nothing to do with the spirit. And these churches are flourishing. Because it appeals to the flesh. This is not the teachings of Christ. In order to have a harvest, there must be a sacrifice. 
How can you have a harvest without a sacrifice is impossible. How dare we ask God for increase if there's no sacrifice? People who are coming to God and praying, oh God bless me. And they're living lives that are a stench in the nostrils of God. And they have the audacity to start demanding God. It doesn't go that way. You think we can have his benefits without his requirements? It doesn't work that way. You can't go to a bank and have a withdrawal of that bank, or whatever it might be, whether it's CIBC or, uh, or Toronto. You, can you imagine going into the bank and, and want to get taken a withdrawal and you don't even have an account in that bank? Are you kidding me? How many Christians are trying to get a withdrawal from God and you got no account with him? You got no relationship with him and you're naming and claiming. Are you kidding me? It's, it's, it's repulsive. It's, it's unconscionable. And it irritates me. And, it, and I don't get angry much in these areas. This angers me. Because it's ruining people's lives. I've dealt with people like this. If there's no sowing, there's no reaping. No sacrifice, no reward. simple that's the way it is I played sports all my life and I can tell you that's true in the physical realm too we had our training camp when I played hockey let me tell you something let me tell you something we trained and trained and trained until we threw up some of us and to, and we kept training and train I had a coach man he wouldn't he was relentless but they prepared us for the game if there's no training no preparation, no sacrifice. Don't expect, expect to have a good game. It won't work. I don't care even if you got natural talent. You won't last. Sacrifice! What did David say? I would not sacrifice of the Lord my God of that which costs me. Salvation is free. Can't earn my salvation, but discipleship will cost you everything. We don't like to hear that today, believe me. Listen, I know this isn't popular, but I'll tell you, my friends, this kind of teaching will get you ready for the coming of the Lord. And that's what I'm concerned about. As a pastor, I'm not, I don't believe I'm, you know, I, I, as a pastor, I believe that's what God has asked me to do as a pastor. I believe there's other areas, but as a pastor, I believe God has spoken very clearly to me. You know, get my people ready for my coming. Can you imagine getting married? Ladies, and you got a nice wedding gown on. It's nice and white and beautiful. Man, oh man, and you're getting ready and you're getting married, you know, and you're walking down that aisle, ladies, and there's your groom waiting for you and the groom's heart is, is pounding and the bride is coming. And her gown is filled with oil stains, tar stains. Her hair is all disheveled, got a black eye. Her gown is ripped. And she's looking around. Hi, everybody. <laughs> well, excuse me? Never. Yet how many of us have black eyes, torn skirts? We're not ready. Soiled garment. He's coming soon for a church without spot or wrinkle. And if we're not getting ready, we'll be living accordingly. I've seen people trying to reap much better than they're sowing, let me tell you. So why, what's the problem? Listen to me, we are living in a narcissistic society. We are living so focused on me, myself, and I. We are consumed with selfies and taking pictures of ourselves. Well, I never used to see that before. Today, everybody's taking pictures of themselves. <laughs> the, everywhere you go, there's somebody giving you this. Are you kidding me? I can't believe it. My wife and I went for one day off. We took off. We went up to the, what was it, Grand Bend? We walked, it was windy. We walked down the beach and we went to, uh, to this, this, uh, 
lighthouse thing. It was a nice, I love that. I had such a good nature. And that's about 15 people. <laughs> like everybody's taking, what happened to giving the camera to somebody else? I don't know what's going on here. You got that lazy. These... We're so consumed. Everyone ought to like me, cater to me. The whole world's about me. This unholy trinity of me, of myself, and I. And the reason why, listen, we're not successful in our marriage, some of us. The reason why I'm not successful in my job, in my ministry, I'll tell you why. Because none of these are designed for a narcissistic lifestyle, especially marriage. Can't! And especially ministry. I know pastors, that if you're in it for yourself, you will fail miserably. Well, I, love, I would love the ministry, pastor, if it wasn't for the people. Fail. <laughs> Flunk. Void. We're living in a narcissistic society, and because of that, and like that, the Greek mindset of the Epicureans still exists today. That's where it came from. And we've absorbed it as a culture. But it's not conducive for the lifestyle that Jesus wants us to live. Listen, you can't be a narcissistic mother and raise children the proper way. I've seen mothers just, their children, they send them off something. Listen, it doesn't work that way. There'll be sleepless nights and painful experiences. You say you want a baby and you're not willing to pay a price? Doesn't work that way. And so it is spiritually. If any man wants to follow me, Jesus said, let him pick up his cross. Let him deny himself. What's happened to that kind of preaching today? In this hot tub, gimme, gimme society. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. Listen. God's looking for full custody. He's not looking for weekend visits. None of us. We don't just come to church Sunday every day. That's what sacrifice is. And it's not always easy. But that's why it's the sacrifice. Sacrifice. We don't like this word sacrifice. But it's the very essence of what Jesus came to do to this earth and in this world. To sacrifice himself. You can't have a harvest without a sacrifice. You see, you can't go the way you are going the way you are going right now, if you are consumed with yourself and expect to be fruitful in the things of God. Listen, how many are locked out of the harvest because you don't participate in sacrifice? Look, folks, I'm not here just to have you come and attend this church. I'm not here for your tithes or for your attendance. Believe me. But I'm telling you, that if you want to be a true believer and you want to grow in the things of God and if you and I are not willing to sacrifice and to deny ourselves you will never be a true believer not only that but you'll never be a person who bears fruit and you'll never be able to be called the salt of this earth because you'd be too consumed with yourself and you can't be salt and be consumed with self at the same time I know this isn't praise the Lord material. I know this isn't jump up and down and give him a shout of praise material. But it's the truth. Did not Paul say, do not be weary in well-doing? Do not be weary. The word weary means to be at a point of fainting. Do not be weary at a point of fainting. That's the Greek. That, that you're, you're so exhausted. You're, do not be weary. You're fainting. You're collapsed. Do not be weary in well-doing. In well-doing. That's a spiritual concept. In well-doing. But in due season. The season is coming. Hold on. Keep believing. Just keep doing. Just hold on. In due season. You shall reap a harvest. If, 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 if you faint not. What happened to that? We faint too easily. We give up too easily. For some of you, you have gone as far as you can go in your current form, my friends. 
You've been as blessed as your narcissistic form can allow you. The point is, the harvest mandates sacrifice. The cross mandates sacrifice. The harvest mandates sacrifice. If Jesus couldn't get past it, how do you think you're going to get past it? That's what Gethsemane was all about. Even Jesus had to go to, had to go. That's why he came to this earth. He's God, but he had to sacrifice. He's God, but he went through the pain. Do you think you and I can get through it somehow? Jesus, when thou goest through the fire, not around it, thou shalt not be burnt. We just want to go around the fire. And I don't want to go through it. I don't want to sacrifice. That's too hot. I want to go around it. Listen, if you don't go through the fire, you'll never be the person God wants you to be. Yeah. Period. Listen. We want to have a Pentecost without a Passover. won't happen the problem is we won't die to our ways that's the problem that's the problem my friends when you look at the early church they were completely dead they were so consumed with God they saw great and mighty things because they were dead to themselves and the reason why we don't see great and mighty things today is because we're not dead God hasn't changed, we have. That's the reason. And if God didn't make an exception for Jesus, I can assure you he will not make an exception for us. And that's possibly why the power is just not there anymore. Or it's as strong as it was. You might say, Pastor, this is a pretty negative... What? No, 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 friends. Let's be honest with each other. Let's, can we be honest? We have shared statistics. We know the church is not what it was. We know the church is declining and souls being saved each year. Uh, baptisms in water each year. Financial, we're going down. At every level we are going down. We must ask ourselves, what is happening? What is happening? Why has the power... Is there something wrong? It, it, we might have his name, but watch this now. Because you have your, his name doesn't mean you have his power. George, you got to turn to Acts 19 for me. You got to turn to Acts 19 for me. Folks, because you have the name of Jesus on your back, or maybe even you go to church, doesn't mean you have the power of Christ in your life. You might have the name, doesn't mean you have the power. Because, because even the devils believe and they tremble. So it's not the fact that you know the name or you have the name or that you even call yourself a Christian. You can call yourself a Christian and still not have the power. In Acts chapter 19... Look at verse number 12, George. I want to show you something. Verse 13. As a certain vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. No, 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 hold on. Here are some vagabond Jews. These were rogue Jews. These were, you know, fringe groups. They kind of liked... To see the sensational, if you will. And they heard about Jesus. They saw disciples casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And they, they intrigued them. They were intrigued by the sensational. Do you know what? People like that today who are intrigued, not with the supernatural, with the sensational. And they got to see sensational things. And so they were intrigued with the sensational. They heard about this name of Jesus. There was power in the name of Jesus. And so they used the name of Jesus. And so they came across a possessed person with demons. And they said, in the name of uh, uh, Jesus, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul, excuse me, whom Paul preaches. Yeah, 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 you demon whom Paul. Oh, really? Verse 14. And there were seven sons of Sceva. This is part of this Jewish vagabond group. The chief of the priests, which did so. Verse 15. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> well, who are you? Who are you kidding? You, well, you're coming here in the name of Jesus that you don't even know? How many people are there in the church who come to church in the name of Jesus, but they don't know who 
Jesus is. They don't have a relationship with him. There's no intimacy. Oh, but they'll use the name of Jesus. And they'll get upset when prayer isn't answered. And they'll, they'll, but they have no relationship with him. You might bear his name, but do you know him? That's the difference. That's what I'm talking about. These Jewish exorcists, they had the name, and, but they didn't know the author. And there are people in thousands upon thousands of churches each Sunday. People come in into some of these prosperity churches. They'll come in. They'll come in. They'll come in groves. Oh, they'll be packed out. They come in, but they're not disciples of Jesus Christ. They want to have their ears tickled. They want to see the sensational. Let me see. But they don't know him. Hence, they have no power. I'm talking about sacrifice. And so what does this text have to do with Pentecost? Everything. Can you turn to Acts chapter 2, George, verses 1 to 4, and let's see if this is the Pentecost feast. What happened on the day of Pentecost? What was so significant? I'm coming to a close in a few moments, so hold on to your hats. But what happened here at, in Acts chapter 2 that is so significant if we're talking about the Feast of Pentecost. Remember, the Feast of Pentecost was a celebration of life, of the feast, of the crops that they had. And it was on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, that was the feast they were celebrating, was fully come. Notice the word fully. This becomes extremely important. Extremely important. Every word is important. We're at a feast. It was fully come. And they were all, not some, in one accord, in one place. Keep going, George. Keep going. Verse number two. Watch this. Watch this. And suddenly, suddenly, they didn't expect it. They were just doing with the promise of the Father. Jesus told them, you go and wait for the promise of the Father. Luke chapter 24. You go to a place and wait and wait. I'm not going to give you the details. Sometimes God tells you to wait and you don't have the details. You just go to that place and wait. Something's going to happen. I'm not going to cross every T for you. I'm not going to dot every... You just trust in me. Wait, wait. They didn't know when the Spirit of God was going to do anything. They just trusted in God. And they were waiting and waiting 10 days. And suddenly... Something happened on the Feast of Pentecost. A mighty rushing wind filled the house. Verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as like fire. And it sat on each one of them. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And the Spirit gave utterance. And I don't have time to get into that. And there was a, a complete cacophony of noises and sounds throughout the whole city. People were just, what? Something happened. Now watch this now. Please stay with me because we're going deeper again. Now, if Jesus is the seed, as he mentions, and if Pentecost is the birthday of the church, this is when the church started on the day of Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit filled these 120 disciples and that's when the, the, the true church began. And then they went into all the world and preached the gospel and that's where we are today. If it started up here in the upper room, then there has to be an impregnation in order for there to be a filling. Something had to happen. In order for there to be a birthday, there needs to be some kind of impregnation. Stay with me. You see, if there's no seed, there can be no birthday. I was born in June in 1958. That means uh, about a year before that, nine months, my mother and father got together and the birds and the bees took place. Correct. I was born nine months later. Correct? Are y'all with me? I think we took a class on the birds of the bees, most of us. Okay. Nine months later, I was born. I have a birthday. I, the birthday is a celebration of, 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 a, of, of, of my birth that took place because mom and dad got together one day. Are you all with me together? Are you with me so far? Okay. Now it becomes important because what we need to understand is the importance of the seed. This is the seed. In our text is Jesus. He is the seed of Abraham, the root of Jesse. So the seed of Christ is telling these Greeks what he's about to do on the cross. The seed needed to be planted. It needed to die. It needed a gestation period. Jesus was on the cross. He died. Went to the depths of the earth. Ephesians tells us. Peter tells us. And he rose from the dead. So the seed entered the earth. 
germinated, died, and it rose to bear fruit. So that's what troubled Jesus was his death, but his glorification was his resurrection. But that principle applies to you and me. You see, this could have never happened if there wasn't a death. If you and I do not die to ourselves, we will never experience a resurrection. We will never have a Pentecost. Why is this important here on the day of Pentecost? Because it's the same principle. When it was the day of Pentecost had fully come, fully come. These disciples have gone through three years most of, of death. God was preparing them. Day by day, they went through all kinds of pains and trials and tribulations. They ended up here in the upper room. They were waiting for... There's something about waiting on God. That just, that just crucifies the flesh. Nothing crucifies the flesh when you're just in prayer waiting on God. That's why waiting is so important. That's why prayer is so important. It crucifies the flesh. You want to you wanna, you wanna die to this? You just wait on God. Let me tell you something. That will, that will just... It just dissolves the flesh. And that's why many of us don't do it. Because the flesh is too alive. They were waiting for 10 days. 10 days. You see, deeper death brings deeper life. Deeper death brings deeper life. And the Bible tells us when the day of Pentecost had fully come, when the gestation period was fully come, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, nine months, if you will, had fully come, they were in one place, in one accord. There was a dilation, if you will, for 10 days. They were dilating in the spirit, if you will. Just stay with me. For 10 days, just like the promise of the Father, Luke 24. Now watch this. Something happened. The Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit suddenly Suddenly, there was a, a noise from heaven. Something took place after the full Pentecost had fully come. The gestation period was over. The disciples were now ready because they were fully surrendered. You see, there would have been no Pentecost if they were not fully surrendered. How many people want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they're not fully surrendered? That's why it doesn't come. That's why it doesn't come. We're not fully surrendered. We're not fully surrendered. So just as Jesus was surrendered on the cross, germinated, if you will, and died, and rose, these disciples on Pentecost, you see the parallels, the parallels, the parallels. On Pentecost, they, they've been surrendered for three years. They were going, and now they're in this room. They're doing nothing for 10 days but prayer. Let me tell you something. That's surrender. I'm ready, Lord. I've locked out everything. I'm just, just you and me, Lord. I'm surrendered. And suddenly, a mighty rushing wind. They were filled. Something powerful happened. The timing was right. Fell on the day of Pentecost. Devout men from every nation, not just Judaism, but Gentiles. Something was happening. They saw the glory of the Lord. There's no glory without surrender. Listen, my friends, th th this is Jesus in another form. This is Jesus in another form. Here we see the Trinity. We see, we see the Holy Spirit coming. Did not Jesus tell his disciples, I will never leave you? Watch this. Stay with me, please. Did not Jesus say, I will never leave you nor forsake? Did he not say in Matthew, any, Lo, I am with you to the very end of the... Did he not say in John 16, I'm sending you a comforter. I got to go to the Father, but don't worry about it. I'm going to send you the comforter. I'm going to send you the Holy... The Greek the word comfort, parakletos, is the word for comforter. It comes from the Greek mindset, the armies, where Alexander the Great would send a paraclete, someone that would rescue someone who's dying to comfort them and bring them back to safety. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It comes and comforts us in our pain and brings us to safety. He says, I'm sending you the comforter. I'm not coming the way I am. I'm sending you. Here is Jesus in another form on the day of Pentecost. Now, no longer am I going to be around you. No longer am I going to surround you. No longer you're going to be physically able to touch me because I'm changing. You're going to, but, but I'll be not around you or beside you. I will be in you. I'll be in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. My God. And I think the devil missed it. Oh, this is just for free, but I think the devil missed it here. 
I really do. Uh, yeah, yeah, he, of course. He, he thought he would kill Jesus. I, that's this is his great moment. I want to kill Jesus. Oh, devil, you're, Jesus came to die. You didn't kill Jesus. He came to die. But he was all happy he, that Jesus died. But he didn't realize. Oh, he didn't realize that now by his spirit, he's got to deal with myriads of people who've got the same spirit that was in Christ is now living in us. He's got a whole army to deal with now. That's you and me. God's got an army. And you're part of it. That's why you're called the salt. But folks, listen to me. The effectiveness of you in this army has to do with your death. Stop living for yourselves. That's what I'm talking about. Just stop it. You'll never grow and be what God wants you to be if you're doing that. I got to stop. Did not he say, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water? Hmm? Christ in us, our hope of glory. Oh, my friends, there's so much more he has to offer us. So much. And so... Uh, We need to ask. Why was there so much noise on the day of Pentecost? The Bible says there was a great noise, a mighty rushing wind, a sound from heaven, tongues and fire and shifting and shaking. We see a processional, if you will, only here in Acts chapter 2. When the Holy Spirit fell in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 19, we do not see that. We only see it here in Acts chapter 2. Only in Acts chapter 2 do we see such a, such a kerfuffle, such a, a noise. A, 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 like what was going on here? Something incredible took place. It was the first time, the first time something. Why? Because, because it was the inauguration of the Holy Spirit coming to the earth in such form. Living now in us, not coming upon us like in the Old Testament, like it did in the Samson, but coming in. It was an inauguration that took place. And so it took a residency within us to reign in us and rule through us, if you will. An inauguration. And so anytime there is an inauguration, there must be some kind of processional. And when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, that's why there was such a processional of waving of Hosanna, Hosanna with palm trees and palm leaves. So God sent wind and noise and sounds from the heavens to lead the way with cloven tongues. And the Holy Spirit came in such power to set his rule and reign. And I believe God is holding his breath. He's holding his breath. He's holding his breath like he did in Genesis 2 when he breathed upon Adam's lungs. And he breathed and gave him life. He's held his breath in Acts chapter 2. He breathed. He breathed upon the church. And life came forth. And I believe he's holding his breath to do it again. Maybe here at Logos. Maybe somewhere else down there. I don't know where. But he's holding. I believe he wants to breathe. And so prophesy to those dead bones. Dead bones. Rise up. Rise up! Rise up! It's time for the church to rise up. I gotta close. This is it, I'm closing, I promise. But I'll tell you something, folks. We are living in challenging moments. I believe we are living in arguably the darkest moment aside from the Middle Ages in church history because, because, I'll tell you why, because we have an appearance of being alive but we are dead. It concerns me greatly. My application in the major life lesson that Jesus is saying here is that in order to have a harvest there must be a sacrifice in order for there to be life there must be death and every woman who gives birth to a child tells us the same thing when my wife gave birth three times to three little girls same thing happened a woman when she's giving birth suffers greatly for some almost to death why? To bring life. Every time a woman gives birth, 
We have the illustration. Sacrifice brings life. If it is true in the natural realm, it is true in the spiritual realm. But man is repulsed, repulsed by the smell of death. We don't like it. But God is attracted to the smell of death. And that's why Paul said, I die daily. Because he knew that in order for him to be used mightily of God, he had to die to the things of this world. This is my final scripture. George, Second Chronicles chapter 5, please. We'll begin at verse 11, and this is it. Here's where I close. Pastor, have we seen this before? You know, this outpouring of the Spirit in a time of surrender, in a time of sacrifice? Have we really seen this before? Absolutely. I believe it's a blueprint. This what I, message I shared with you is a blueprint of effectiveness when it comes to the things of God. I don't care if you're in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. There is no true fruit without surrender. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not, they wait by course. Verse 11, notice now verse, verse 12, there were Levites, thousands, hundreds of Levites, verse 13, and even came to pass, there were trumpeters, there were worshipers, there was music, and all of a sudden in the midst of of this time of sacrifice and celebration, verse number 13, the last few words, and then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. As the priests sanctified themselves, consecrated themselves, as they repented, as they sacrificed unto the Lord, and they made themselves pure, if you will, before God, that's when the Holy Spirit descended and filled the place. Give me chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, George. When Solomon ended the prayer, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice and the glory of the Lord filled the house. There's Pentecost in a nutshell. The same thing that you see here is what happened on the day of Pentecost. They were surrendered. They were surrendered. And the fire fell. You can't have the fire without surrender. You can't have the fire without a death. When the fire came on Elijah. He repaired the altar. Things were right. And we can experience the same things if we do the same things they did. God hasn't changed. We have. And I believe God is looking for some people who get serious, who are willing to surrender their lives and sacrifice, stop living for themselves and realize that you've got a purpose in this world to be the salt of this earth. But you can't be salt without surrender. Can we stand together, please? I know that uh, it's holiday season and I know it's summer and I know we got plans and I understand all that and I know that many of us are away today and 
But I can't let you go unless I at least ask you and challenge you to look within your hearts today. To look within your hearts today, all of us, myself. I look within my heart. Lord, am I surrendered to you? Because I got to have clean hands, I got to have a clean heart. Remember, Jesus is speaking to the Greeks who are seeking truth. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks your face. Bend my heart, Lord. Make me humble, break me, make me surrender. That's what this song's all about. This song, Josh, is a picture of what I'm talking about in music. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. I want to surrender my life to you, Lord. I want to surrender it, Lord. I want to seek you. I want, to, I want you first in my life, Lord. I, because I can't be the man that you called me to. I can't be the, the young person that God's called me. I can't be the married couple. I can't be the seniors. I can't be the person that you've called me to be unless I've surrendered my life to you. You might say, Pastor, I'm a Christian. For uh, Listen, you can be a Christian and not surrendered completely to God. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. It's not about the name. It's about your heart. Give us clean hands. We bow our hands. We bow our hands. I know that some of us have left, but most of us are here. Now, folks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you one more thing. Just one more thing. I'm serious about this. Because, folks, whether we understand it or not, this message you heard today is the premise for everything in your life that pertains to spiritual growth. This message is the key to your growth. Not my words, what Jesus said. Except the grain falls to the earth and dies, it abides. If you're still living for yourself, you will never be the person God wants you. And you'll never enter into your destiny. I'm inviting everyone here to make a declaration. Say, God, I, I want to stand before you today. And I want to be that seed that falls to the earth and dies. Because I want fruit in my life. I'm tired of biting alone. I'm tired of being fruitless. That's what it means. If that's you and you're serious for God, then I'm going to invite, look, I'm not even going to push this because I don't do it anyway. I'm just going to simply invite you and say, God, I want to take that stand today. If that's you, I want you to fill this way. Just come on down. Don't look around left, right. If, you, if you're serious for God, this is your moment right now. The hour has come for you to stop abiding alone. Say, God, use me. Use me, Lord. I need fruit in my life. I want you to stand before the Lord as we declare it before Him. This is between you and God. This is between you and God. This is between you and our Master. Come on now. We bow our hearts. We hunger after you, Lord. Oh, God, make a way in this place, Lord. Jesus, Jesus. Desire. It's our desire.